Okay, I'm going to let you um, introduce yourself, if you will, please. But I know that you're um, a well, highly regarded um, lecturer in climatology at the University of Wisconsin. And I'll let you, um, I know that you're doing some fascinating areas of research, but I, I think it's only fair to let you do it yourself. I apologize for- Okay, that's not, not a problem. And, and thanks for having me and um, glad we can at least do this virtually, even if uh, we couldn't do it just in person. I think we had originally tried to schedule this last March or April, just before right. everything was about to uh, right. shut down. And so it was one of the last talks I had to sadly uh, reschedule. Uh, before we got moving. So I'm glad that we can do this. And I gather from talking with Richard and others that you are a group that is already passionate about talking about science and climate and energy. And so there may be things here that are maybe things you've seen before, but I'm happy to kind of you know, be open-ended. We can have some discussion at the end. Um, I'll kind of talk about some of the work that broadly us in climate science have been working on recently, as well as the basics, um, and talk a tiny bit about some of my research that my students is, and, and folks in my lab's done. So yes, my name is Ankur Desai. Uh, you can call me Ankur. And uh, I have been a professor. I'm the Reed Bryson Professor of Climate, People, and Environment at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, these days, I'm mostly professor of my children's playroom uh, because that's where I've been since March. I haven't been to campus and my kids are in virtual school in different rooms. So don't mind if I have to kind of occasionally yell out, out the side here, but uh, things are going okay. Um, my lab studies basically the role of ecosystems and climate. So we look broadly at forests, wetlands, lakes, a whole variety of systems. And so you'll see bits and pieces of that in this presentation I've prepared for, for the next uh, bit. Uh, feel free to um, pop in questions, I suppose, on the chat or however you prefer to do that. And hopefully you will learn something new today. So I'm gonna share my screen here and hopefully, um, let me do that. Let me start slideshow. And you can see my slides. Can, can yes, you confirm? Thank you. Great. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I titled this talk, uh, which is probably one of my general uh, chats I do about climate and climate change. Uh, climate change to can people, right? Because, you know, a big question we want to know is not just how is the climate changing and why, but what exactly uh, are we likely to see in the future and how do people respond to this? And I think this is a really fun question and it's really fun to think about right now, given just looking at how states and countries and individuals are responding to the pandemic and how we are addressing public health challenges. While it's a very, very different problem, there's some lots of similarities in how we communicate risk, how individuals um, adapt to behavior, how regulatory agencies communicate as well. And I think some of the challenges as well as some of the successes uh, have taught me that as a climate scientist, I actually have a lot to learn from the public health community. And, and that's something that's been really exciting. So of course, people do change. We just had an election among other things and we've seen some changes occurring out of that. But from the perspective of the climate and the atmosphere, that's less important than just what's broadly happening in the background globally, right? So, you know, thinking about the last four to five years, what are some things that have changed, right? So. Um, we, uh, based on our best estimates, there's roughly 400 more million people in the world since the, approximately the last presidential election in the US. Most of those are not in the US, um, but those people have been added to the planet who have all been producing and productive economically. And as a result, uh, we've seen fossil fuel emissions increase globally everywhere. And over the last five years, uh, that's been a uh, about a, a four to five percent increase. One of the things you might notice in this figure, and this is a wonderful set of um, uh, figures from something called the Global Carbon Project that you can also download online, is this change in increase is driven by a number of places in the world, but you'll notice that places like the U.S. and China um, have actually been somewhat flat to maybe slightly uh, rising while other parts of the world have been increasing faster. And that's a change over the last few decades. You'll also notice that these days, China produces about twice as many emissions of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases that contribute to global warming as the US. And we'll come back to this at the end as we think about, well, how do we actually address climate change? Because that's a real complication. And then notice down here how rapidly countries like India's emissions have been rising, while how rapidly um, the European Union's emissions have been declining. 
Well, those emissions have then influenced the atmosphere. So when you emit fossil fuels, you emit carbon dioxide to the atmosphere and that carbon dioxide then increases. My lab directly measures CO2 out of a 1500 foot tower in Northern Wisconsin. And we work with folks at the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration to combine that data with data they collect around the world. You probably are familiar with the one in Hawaii, Mauna Loa, which is the longest record and the first, but there's actually about 200 of, this, of these sites around the world where we carefully collect and calibrate CO2 data. And if we just look at the last decade and then again, the last uh, four years uh, using our election timeframe as a framework to think about change, um, you know, CO2 is increasing, not surprisingly. We've gone up another 4% since 2016. Uh, so it's about 15 parts per million. That is for every million molecules in the air, which are mostly oxygen and nitrogen, about 400 to 410 of those are CO2. You'll also notice that there's a large seasonal cycle from one year to the next. It's high in the spring and it's low in the summer of the Northern Hemisphere. And that's really the signal of um, the Northern Hemisphere greening and senescence that occurs at summer and fall. And it really will hint at that toward the end again, because that actually is telling us that the biosphere, which is what my lab studies, um, has a strong role to play in the carbon cycle or how much CO2 is in the atmosphere. And there may be ways that we can actually help limit the rise of CO2 in the atmosphere using the biosphere uh, in a way, to, a sustainable way. So of course, has climate responded? Well, the short answer is yes. And it's a little trickier as we'll see in a few slides later, but temperature rises and falls as a number of factors, including weather patterns and circulation. But because the CO2 is increasing that background, you're loading the dice essentially, um, has led to an increase in temperature. It's subtle, right? It's about a third of a degree Fahrenheit, which is not something that individually it's easy to fill. And that's globally average. Um, but it's certainly something that points to, if we actually take the rise in CO2 and the rise in temperature and we divide one by the other, just to get a slope or sensitivity as we call it, um, and we brought that out, that's actually about a 1.8 degree Fahrenheit rise for every 100 parts per million increase in the CO2 or roughly 20 years of emissions. 1.8, if you know your unit conversions is the same as a degree Celsius. Um, so that's roughly something that we look at when we think about how sensitive is Earth climate to fossil fuel emissions. This number, as we'll see, is actually really close to what we know from all sorts of other types of studies in basic physics. If we extrapolate that out for a doubling of CO2, which is a common unit that we use, uh, it's about a three degrees Celsius change. And we're gonna point out, is three degrees a big deal or not? Well, it can be for some things. And also is three degrees for doubling of CO2, which I've extrapolated solely from this one measurement, uh, this one set of measurements, uh, actually realistic or not. And it turns out it's actually a really good estimate. So keep that number in the back of your head. This warming or this temperature above our average that we saw say in the 1950s through 1980s has been consistent over the globe. And you'll see that there's some pretty common patterns where the red colors here represent warmer and the blue colors here represent colder than the 1950 to 1980 average for any one spot on the globe. And the difference between say 2015 and 2020 is pretty subtle, right? The same things are happening. The Arctic is warming about twice as fast as the rest of the globe. And there's good physical reasons for why that is. Um, the, there are some interesting dynamics. Continents are warming faster than the oceans. And that's also basic physics. Water takes longer to heat up than rocks. Um, and we also see that some really curious spots where uh, you actually have cooling like off the coast of Greenland and off the coast of Antarctica. Um, and these aren't just artifacts. There are good, there are some measurements of these, and these are actually the signal of the change in ocean circulation and an increase in melting ice into the ocean waters, which is influencing air temperature. And so we can actually see that and detect that, and that's been consistent from year to year. So you know, has this made an impact uh, to how the public perceives? Uh, and I think the answer is yes, over the last five years, we've had a number of large extreme events. Now extreme events may or may not be, you can't really say they're caused by climate change because that's actually not a well-formed question, right? The question is, did climate change exacerbate or make an event more likely or more intense than it would have been otherwise? Uh, and that's certainly the case in some things. So for example, we've had a series of relatively intense um, tropical cyclone or hurricane season. So this is Hurricane Harvey. And there's good evidence that the intensity of hurricanes has been increasing because of ocean temperatures. 
that they've also been slowing down when they uh, hit land um, because of the way climate works. And that's why you can have things like 30 inch rainfalls in Houston a few years back. Um, we've also seen last year, if you remember in the before times, before the pandemic, there was also the big news was Australia was on fire. So these are eucalyptus trees. Um, Australia eucalyptus forests burn pretty regularly, but what was unique about this was the magnitude and intensity. It was about, about 20% of all eucalyptus forests in Australia had some magnitude of fire. So this is just looking near Sydney, Australia. Um, which is, you know, again, a sign of consistent hot weather and droughts. And that's something that's also been seen last summer, for example, in the Western United States, where it's atmospheric circulation that drives which parts of the world are going to be hot or cold. But the fact that these highs are particularly hot and dry and promoting extended fire seasons is basically the background of climate change operating on this temperature. And so we saw some uh, dramatic temperatures hit in late September in downtown LA hitting 111 degrees Fahrenheit, which LA does get hot, uh, but that is unusually hot. Closer to home, we've also seen other impacts and uh, particularly in the Midwest, a lot of that has been surrounding flooding and infrastructure, uh, increased rainfall. And so this is just a picture outside of Superior, Wisconsin, where some bridges have been hit by high water levels in the last few years. Um, I bring these events up not to either alarm you or to even make you go into details of these, but to say that, you know, the number and increase of these events has caused the public to be more aware, I think, of what's been going on with the climate and to think more broadly about climate change, uh, maybe in a way that hasn't been done in the past, even if it hasn't necessarily led to some level of political action on it. Um, and, and we're seeing this right now, of course, we have now a record breaking hurricane season with the strongest hurricane ever on Atlantic Basin in November, Hurricane Iota. We've now gotten into Greek letters because we've run out of names, which has only happened once before, um, where uh, Iota is a category four storm probably hitting Nicaragua later this week. Um, and you know, we'll hope the best. They just got hit by Hurricane Ada a few days last week. Um, and now the number of hurricanes, we don't have good evidence is linked to climate change, but the fact that we're seeing them so late in the season and that they're so intense is definitely a signal of a warmer and more active ocean basin. So not surprisingly, and this is one that maybe may be surprising to some of you, that the vast majority of Americans are accept that climate change is happening and that's the problem. And so there's this lovely set of slides that you can go into a website from the Yale Program on Climate Change Communication. If you just search climate change Yale, um, you'll get these surveys and they survey county level individuals every year. Uh, and they've been doing these for the last decade or so. So this one came out last April. And so I'm just showing you a zoom in of, of the upper Midwest, uh, but you could also look at this by congressional district or county or city. And one of the things you can see is, you know, not surprisingly, people in Dane County, 80 percent accept that climate change is occurring. And, and you can drill into further questions about causes and scientists and things like that. But what's what's encouraging is that, you know, we tend to think of this as a polarized issue, but it's really not right. We have more than 70 percent, vast majority of individuals accept that something is happening and it's not, it is certainly linked to the increase in events that people have been experiencing. Not surprisingly, another group, uh, the George Mason Center, uh, also um, surveys individuals about their concern about climate change. And this one is also, I think, often surprising to members of the public who haven't seen this, um, is that over the last five years and even 10 years, the percentage of people who are concerned or even alarmed uh, about climate change has dramatically increased relative to the much smaller percentage of people who are dismissive or doubtful. And we tend to have a perception that might be amplified by how media reporting is, might be amplified by how individual actors influence governments and lobbying that this upper side, these upper two dismissive and doubtful are a much larger fraction of the population and a much larger fraction of the conversation. And that's actually not true, right? And it's something that I think is important to keep in mind. We tend to say like, well, what we're gonna do about all the people who don't accept that climate change is a problem. It's real, the scientists understand it. And my, you know, and, and this may be a little bit me getting a little political, it's, uh, there are not that many of them. And, and they may be powerful because there are some areas where they have lots of um, yeah, interests to protect. But in terms of the fact that we do have a, a large populace that is concerned about the negative impacts of climate change, uh, 
and that that number has been increasing suggests that this is the time to really start thinking about how do we address these concerns. Now, this is occurring under a backdrop of lots of political action as well. And so we did, of course, just on November 4th last week, uh, formally withdrew from the Global Paris Agreement. Uh, this was an agreement, it was not, it, it was semi-binding, but essentially it encouraged countries to limit their emissions. The US withdrew under the uh, previous president's administration. We'll see what happens with the next president and how, um, whether or not we'll re-enter that and what that means. Uh, but the short answer is even beyond that, there's lots of things happening uh, at country, state, county level. So for example, some of the figures I'll show are from the fourth national climate assessment. Congress is mandates the uh, executive White House branch to do this every four years. And they've actually done a really thorough job of saying how does climate change impact the US even under uh, the prior administration that's outgoing. Um, the state of Wisconsin has recently, uh, after the 2018 election, put out several executive orders on both energy and climate change. They've restarted a task force that's head up by uh, Vice Governor Mandela Barnes. Um, and that's also then led to a revival of something called the Wisconsin Initiative on Climate Change Impacts, which I'm guessing a lot of you have heard about, but this was started in 2011 under the Jim Doyle administration and continued uh, afterwards to focus and bring together university, uh, private industry and uh, federal, county, state, tribal um, and um, government agencies to talk about specific impacts of Wisconsin uh, from climate change. And a nice thing is they've recently just updated their website. There's beautiful figures, there's some recent reports, there's some recent documents that if you're looking for something specific about fishing, about forestry, about snow, about lakes, uh, about infrastructure in Milwaukee, there are things you can get there to there. So if I don't answer any of those specific things, please do reach search that site, uh, which we often abbreviate wiki, W-I-C-C-I. Now, you may be wondering, of course, we do have this pandemic, which has recently occurred and has been spreading across the globe, uh, leading to, and I hope everyone is able to do their best to stay safe and to stay distant. And hopefully, we will do our best over this uh, upcoming holiday season to minimize additional spread. But one of the things you might have been wondering is, well, did this lockdown and did the, the ensuring that it did occur in the spring actually influence the climate? And the short answer is, not a lot. And is there anything we can learn from that? And the short answer again is not too much other than the public health response. So the global lockdowns did lead to about a 17% drop in April emissions. That's mostly been um, back to where we are now. Um, that doesn't sound like a lot, but that actually was the biggest drop since World War II um, in terms of CO2 emissions. And it will probably end up at the end of the year being a total of around five-ish percent, right? So this figure is just showing kind of how quickly CO2 emissions dropped as economic activity stopped just about everywhere in the world. And then it's slowly been coming up. Unfortunately, I don't have a good update of this slide, but I'd love to see what it looks like right now. But even with that level of change, you know, if you look at that atmospheric parts per million, right? CO2 in the atmosphere stays in the atmosphere for about a century. So what you're really seeing when you look at the CO2 in the atmosphere is really the long history of the Industrial Revolution. And small changes like that that are short term, yeah, they probably changed atmospheric CO2 by a tenth of a part, half a part per million. And I, we feel pretty confident on this because I can measure CO2 down to about a tenth of a part per million accuracy. Um, is still going to be, you know, it's, it's not enough, right? And it certainly points to this idea, right? Does it, there has been some ideas banning about, oh, well, climate change is gonna require a similar level of economic lockdown. And that's not entirely correct, right? And, and that's not a good message, right? Lockdowns are not the solution to environmental challenges. They're good short-term solutions to public health challenges, apparently, but they, the idea that, you know, to solve climate change requires massive economic disruption uh, I think is a false message. And hopefully the lockdown in some ways tells us that, you know, it's not so much what we do as how we actually talk about and how we think about the policies that we place in the long term to prevent, right? And the good news from that same set of surveys I showed earlier is that policy support for fundamental ideas that would limit the negative effects of climate change also have vast majority form of support. So whether that's funding research, whether that's regulation of CO2, uh, regulation of coal plants, uh, fossil fuel carbon taxes, uh, utility rene um, renewable energy mandates, um, 
you know, you, as a, if you're a political scientist, you could try, you know, find all sorts of challenges when you ask questions like this, how individuals respond, because of course there's no cost initially assigned to these. But the basic idea is that the public is particularly interested in understanding how we might be able to mitigate the worst effects of climate change. And there are things that exist, policy tools that, yeah, do have a cost to them, do require long-term commitments and global cooperation, but they're not anything like a, you know, short-term intense lockdown. The real challenge when it comes to climate policy, though, is this is the other side of the survey, which is the how limited um, exposure most of the public has, even though they're concerned, to global warming uh, science, right? It's only 30% of the population in this survey uh, discusses global warming at some level. Only a quarter have heard about it in the media at least once a week. Um, and of course, so part of my role in, in giving these is to help change some of this problem down here, which is, as a scientist, it doesn't it's not my role to say per se how these policy things get implemented and what they mean and which are the best for society. But I can make a lot of dent in this lower one of thinking about how individuals talk about the science in a way that actually promotes using science for policy. And I hope that we get some of that today. Um, and I do appreciate that you as a group have already talked about this many times. And so you are way on the right side of this graph and you should feel great that I'm really pleased that you have this active group that talks about these issues. It's something that's unique and it's sadly not something that occurs everywhere. So my lab, what do, what do we do? Um, so I've been working for the last uh, 12 years in Wisconsin, but about two decades uh, over my academic research career. I got my PhD at Penn State and have lived in Colorado for a while and in Minnesota and here in Wisconsin. And a lot of our work has been in using Northern Wisconsin as a test bed to understand how ecosystems are responding. So these are just pictures of me. I don't really get to do much field work anymore because most of the days I sit in the office. But uh, a lot of what we do is really try to understand what's happening in the biosphere and making precise and careful measurements of CO2 and other greenhouse gases, and as well as having some fun uh, in places. I, this is a wonderful state, and it's a great state to spend time in, especially uh, uh, up north, uh, is some of my favorite landscapes in the world. But the real uh, stars and heroes of, of, of my work are, is my lab. And so this is, again, a picture from the before times when we could actually get together in places like Mickey's Dairy Bar. And so this, these, this is what climate scientists look like, in case you weren't sure. Uh, but they're from all over the world, whether they're from Indonesia or China or India or Germany, uh, students from New York and California and Wisconsin. Uh, they focus on questions about everything from snow and ice to vegetation to climate dynamics to the monsoon system. Um, these are the folks who are what climate science today looks like and what we're actually working on. And we're housed here broadly on campus, mostly in the Department of Atmospheric and Oceanic Sciences, which is one of the oldest meteorology programs in the country. Uh, and we have a rich history, particularly in the development and invention of satellites uh, for meteorology, as well as a lot of work that went into uh, making those satellites accessible to the public in terms of weather animations and the development of some private industries, such as Weather Central that came out of our building. Uh, we're also tied to the Nelson Institute on the Environment, which I believe most of you have heard of, that does work on climate. And the Center for Climate Research, which I'm an affiliate of and is where Reed Bryson founded. And so I'm the namesake professor of that uh, institute right now, as well as my work in lakes with the North Temperate Lakes long-term ecological research site, which up in the Trout Lake region of Boulder Junction, as well as in the Yahara system of Madison has spent decades uh, uh, since 1980, uh, continually studying lakes. It is the most densely studied set of lakes in the world. So what is climate, right? This is an audience that I could probably give this as a quiz and you'd give me way better answers, but this is kind of I, the way I like to think about it. Climate is, is not a magical thing. It's just averages, right? It's just the average of weather. And this is a quote that's often incorrectly attributed to Mark Twain, uh, but climate is what you expect, weather is what you get, right? So it's kind of, it sets the stage for weather, weather. And I like this idea that climate changes naturally, right? So climate does change and climate scientists know that, they're the ones who've told you that, um, and by humans, but over different time scales. Uh, one of my favorite quotes is from Marshall Shepard, the former president of the American Meteorological Society and professor at University of Georgia, uh, sorry, actually Georgia Tech, um, that's a mistake. Uh, 
Uh, but I like his quote, which is what climate is your personality and weather is your mood, right? Where climate is kind of the average of all of the ways that our weather system behaves. And changing that is essentially a change in your background or your personality, whereas the weather any one day to next is kind of just what's going on right now in this chaotic system. So we can look at weather and climate. So the State Climatology Office, an unfunded uh, office of our department, yeah, despite it being called a State Climatology Office, um, uh, has great graphics of all the cities of Madison. And so this is every day's high and low temperature in the black bar from January 1st to yesterday or a few days ago. Uh, in Madison at Dane County Airport. And what you see there, of course, are the swings of weather. So you have some days that are cold, some days that are warm. You may remember we had a warm spell in the beginning of January and again in February. Summer was, you know, pretty darn steady through most of the summer. And then we just recently had this amazing fall uh, heat wave, right? Or at least for November, it's a heat wave of the last uh, few days and hopefully was about maybe the last time we'll get to have some nice uh, socially distanced outdoor events uh, again for a bit. But what's more interesting to me are the red and the blue curves, which are the averages over the last 30 years, 1980 to 2010 in this case. And that's telling you the average high and the average low in Madison. And not surprisingly, it's cold in winter and it's warm in summer. And what's interesting is how often are these gray bars above or below those lines? Because that tells you when is the weather normal. When the people say normal, they mean statistically normal when the folks in the weather broadcast say that. That means it's in between the red and the blue. Um, and when is it above or below normal, which is saying that today's weather or high or low is above or below that red or blue curve, which is just weather. It's your mood moving around beyond your personality. So we can do that not just for one year, but for every year. And if we do that, we can start to look from, in this case, from 1940 to present, the average temperature in Madison over the year and the average high and the average low. And if you squint your eyes and you work hard and you might come back and say, I don't see any trend in here. And that's an actually a accurate per, the thing to say for the most part. There may be some highs, but, and what you see is some frequency of the red curve being higher than lower more often. But really what you primarily see is if you, if you point your eye is that there is a trend, but the trend is in the blue curve. And we'll see that what's interesting is if you look from about 1980 to 2020, the average low in Madison has increased by about four to five degrees Fahrenheit or two to three degrees Celsius, whereas the average high hasn't changed much at all. And we can speculate at the end as to why. But what's really interesting in the Midwest is the signal of climate change has been primarily in our cold temperatures. Now you might say that's not a big deal. It's nice that it's a little bit less cold. But as we'll see, that actually has a lot of implications for how um, systems, ecosystems respond and behave and how we adapt to this. Now, climate change isn't about not what's just going on in your backyard. It's really about to really see the signal of climate change, you have to look at weather stations all over the world. And we can start with North America. So if we do all the same exact analysis, but for the average temperature for all of North America, you start to get to some interesting patterns, right? One is there are cold years and warm years, so reds are warmer than average, blues are colder than average. This is summer, so it, and, and, you, and you can see some interesting things. The 1930s were particularly warm in North America. That's the signal of the Dust Bowl, right? And, and, and that actually has to do with circulation patterns as well as some links to land use change uh, during that time. Um, and you can also see these cooling periods in the 60s and 70s that are maybe linked actually to air pollution. But one of the things I like to tell about my undergraduate students is that they have been born in an era where they've actually never experienced below average temperatures in the US. Um, and that's something that, you know, the students these days are now born in around 2001 or so, 2002. Um, what's interesting is not so much the trend when you look at an individual continent, but kind of the frequencies of the lows and the highs. It's only when you, though, take it across the entire world that some of these kind of smaller scale impacts like the Dust Bowl and stuff kind of disappear. And that's really another thing that's really hard, hard message about climate change, which is that what's happening in any one spot isn't a story. The story is what's happening everywhere at once on average, which is kind of changing the personality of climate. And, 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 and I struggle a lot with how to, how to present that. And, you know, I've used these set of slides for, for many years just to kind of get a basic picture of like, it's not about your weather station, which could be doing one thing or another. It's about how the world as a whole 
has been systematically changing by about a degree Celsius. Now, how does that look across the globe? Hopefully this animation will uh, be not too choppy on your Zoom link, but what you can see here is this is now taking that same data, but mapping it across the globe. There's all these gray areas because in the 19th century, there's not as much good data. But as we get into the um, present, we start to see the world getting covered with data from temperature stations that are carefully harmonized. This is actually a group that spent a lot of time very skeptical of this data set and kind of came back and said, yeah, this is the best we can do. And the blues show you colder than average, the reds warmer than average over to 1950 to 1980 average. And you know, from any one year to next, you can just see there's some places that are warm, some places that are cold. You also see like every two to five years, the tropical Pacific gets warm and cold. That's something we call El Nino, which you might've heard of. Um, you can see some sort of interesting dynamics where if it's warm in the Arctic, it's often warm in, in cold in North America and vice versa. But it's when you start getting past 1980, things get interesting. Right. And then as you start getting into the 90s, the blues start to disappear. They still happen. So here's 2013, 14, that particularly cold winter we had in Eastern North America and in Wisconsin. Uh, and that's really a localized impact. And as you can see, most of Siberia and Western North America was particularly warm. And you start to see those same images I showed you again uh, earlier in the beginning of this uh, discussion. And what you see is kind of a disappearing of the cold anomalies, except for things like El Nino and La Nina. So for example, we're entering a La Nina right now. What does that look like for weather though, right? Because that's, that's climate. And again, it's hard for individuals to feel what an average means. And what does an average one degree Celsius change in temperature mean? Well, so the New York Times had this lovely interactive graphic uh, recently where they showed, for example, your summer temperatures in a, across weather stations in all of the Northern Hemisphere. And if you know statistics, you know that this is something like a normal or Gaussian curve. What it shows is that on any one day, it might be normal, it might be cold, it might be hot above or below normal. And if we said this is what 1950 to 1980 was like, and you have extreme cold days and extreme hot days happen with low probability, but they're big deals, what we actually see in measurements in weather stations today is two things. One, we've shifted that one degree Celsius average change leads to a much greater frequency of our hot extremes. So while one degree doesn't sound like a lot, it leads to much more frequency of that 111 degrees day in Los Angeles. Now, it doesn't mean we get rid of cold extremes. You still have cold winters. You still have them. They just occur less frequently. And what we know in the US is we now set about two record highs for every one record low over the last 20 years relative to a one-to-one -one frequency that you would expect in the 1980s and 90s. Um, so that's what climate change looks and feels like in the case of summer heat extremes. This isn't new science, and that's another thing I often like to uh, bring up, right? The, I love this newspaper article from 1912 in New Zealand. Uh, coal consumption affects climate. The furnaces of the world are now burning two uh, billion tons of coal. When burned with oxygen, it produces seven billion tons of CO2 to the atmosphere. This makes the air a more effective blanket for Earth and raises temperature maybe considerable in a few centuries. What's amazing about this newspaper article, one, is that it's from 1912, and two, it's actually very scientifically accurate with the exception of the last sentence, right? So the, the science behind this was pretty well known uh, through the 19th century. Uh, folks like John Tyndall, physicist, Fonte Arrhenius in Sweden, um, uh, Eunice Foote, which was one of the first women in sciences and, and, and has actually only been recently recognized and appreciated for her foundational work on the role of CO2 on climate in the 1860s. Um, really made the understanding of how climate was going to change pretty well understood by the end of the 19th century. And most of it got quiet because there was two assumptions that they made incorrect. One was the idea that this was going to take a long time because the oceans were going to absorb a lot of the CO2. That was shown to not be true by the 1950s by work by Charles Keeling and his advisor, Roger Revelle. Uh, when they made these foundational studies in 1957 of the ocean carbon and then started measuring CO2 in the atmosphere in Hawaii. Um, and then later on, this idea that there's no way that we would have a world of 7 billion people using up a large fraction of the world's coal, oil, and gas, uh, that was very hard to fathom. And in fact, some of the foundational papers in, uh, from Savante Arrhenius makes a back-of-the-envelope calculation for climate change in the 20th century that is remarkably accurate. Uh, for its, um, the number it gets, uh, but then kind of dismisses it as there's no way that England would burn that much coal, 
Um, and so, you know, sometimes a failure of imagination can sometimes limit you from accepting what your scientific numbers are actually telling you. And the reason this is well known is because this is basic modern physics of the interaction of matter with light, right? So what we're talking about is carbon dioxide and methane are greenhouse gases are emitted by and taken up by nature, but they're also emitted in excess by humans when we burn 60 million year old plants that are in locked up in the form of coal or oil. And the cool thing these days is that we can actually detect how that increasing CO2, which changes the amount of infrared light absorbed by the atmosphere, which changes the temperature of the atmosphere, which then changes the amount of energy that's reflected back to the Earth's surface, we can actually detect that from space now. So this was a cool animation on Twitter, which is where all the best climate animations live. Um, my Twitter is very different than I think most people's, but mine's is full of things like this. Um, this is actual satellite measurements. I mean, this is a really complex graph and I don't want to go into it, but this is basically the amount of infrared light that's escaping to space. And in wavelengths where CO2 tends to absorb those lights. And that's really the fundamental interaction that drives the so-called greenhouse effect. And you can directly see in a 20 year record the change in infrared absorption that's entirely consistent with how CO2 influences uh, the climate and how the amount of emissions of fossil fuels change the CO2 in the atmosphere. There is zero doubt among working actual climate scientists about how climate change works, what's causing it, and that we can detect it, right? And I know that that message has taken a while to catch up with the public. Um, and you actually see that in those Pew Center surveys where you know the belief that climate scientists are confused about climate change is much higher than what climate scientists would argue, is that you can see this from so many different angles that the preponderance of evidence would require a significant revision of all of basically 20th century physics uh, for us to be able to say this isn't what's causing climate change. And we can see it in other records from geologists who study paleoclimate and look at, for example, pollen records and ice core records and glacial records. And you can look at the last 2000 years of climate through those remarkable painstaking measurements. And we can measure CO2 trapped in ice cores uh, from snow in Antarctica and Greenland. And the last 2000 years, a period at which human civilization settled and agriculture became our dominant form of feeding and, and securing ourselves, um, was a period of, of particularly stable climate. We had some areas like the medieval warm period and little ice age in Europe that allowed for ex ex expansion of exploration from the Scandinavians or periods where we had massive crop failures. Uh, but those fluctuations, you know, for, even if our best guesses of uncertainty were relatively small compared to where we are today uh, in terms of the start of the industrial revolution, the emissions of CO2 and the change in climate that's been occurring. Um, so this used to be an area of debate as well, but that's kind of also been put to rest. Uh, we're very, very confident that what we're seeing today is far outside the norm of what human civilization has settled under. And CO2 today is now higher than anything in the last million years based on actual measurements. There was just a paper that came out too that's exciting, excites me. Some climate scientists have also looked at really past climates, so really far climates where you can look at ocean sediment cores and so if you look at the late Pleistocene, the early Eocene or the Paleocene, Eocene thermal maxima. These are all periods in past climates of the Earth's where we had natural large scale emissions of CO2 or other greenhouse gases and large scale changes in climate, sometimes initiated by orbital changes in Earth. And for each one of these, we can estimate that so-called climate sensitivity. Remember that number I mentioned of how much is climate change for a doubling of CO2. And there's good mathematical reasons why we use doubling. Uh, it's mostly because CO2's impact on climate is logarithmic. And one of the things you can tell is there's some uncertainty in these numbers, but remember that number that I estimated by eyeball uh, with 10 years of data came in at roughly three degrees Celsius per doubling. And these numbers here are all accounting for volcanoes, change in solar energy and sun strength and change in some of the other features that are often also drivers of climate. In the, uh, but in a smaller scale. CO2 is uh, Earth's thermostat. And what we're doing today is like the same thing as what steroids did to baseball batting averages, right? Which is another quote from a Washington Post reporter slash UW atmospheric science alumni, Jason, same now. Um, and, and this was another great animation from Bloomberg magazine uh, that was published a few years back. This is the observed global temperature, which we've now seen in a few different slides. And we can actually run computer models with where we can put in all the physics 
of how Earth's orbits change, how Earth's sun changes, how volcanic explosions, which tend to temporarily cool climate, occur. And we can ask, well, to what extent does it explain, right? This is hypothesis testing 101, right? How much can we falsify what we observe in climate from natural factors? And the truth is from 1950 onward, we can't. So then we start putting in, say, other factors. Well, what about land use change? Land clearing actually cools climate a little bit and warms climate in the tropics. What about air pollution, aerosols, and ozone? Well, those have mixed effects. And what about greenhouse gases like CO2, which actually warm climate more than we've actually observed? If we put those pieces together, we get to so-called human factors. The human factors do a better job, right, explaining the change in observed climate. But it's really when we put all pieces together, and that's really why we need these fancy, sophisticated computer models to actually make projections of future climate. It's not so much that the physics is hard, it's actually really straightforward. It's all of these little kind of small changes have minor effects on climate that you have to put together. And we can't explain every single wiggle because that's weather, right? And that's, you know, little things like El Nino, which are really hard to predict. But we know broadly what's going on. All right, so what does that look like in Wisconsin? Well, like I mentioned, what we've seen over the last 50 years is that Wisconsin is getting less cold. So if you look at annual temperature change, that is more modest than what's changing in winter. And so winter here on the right has been warming relatively quickly. And it's kind of consistent with the mid-continent where we're more affected by snow cover and um, not as affected by what's happening in the oceans. What that generally means is that the growing seasons have lengthened, right? So um, we're about a week or two earlier in spring and a week or two later in fall on average. And there's really good evidence that that's actually affecting ecosystems. So this great paper from Nina Leopold Bradley, granddaughter of Aldo Leopold, uh, showed very um, consistently from their observations at the shack in Baraboo, uh, where Aldo Leopold's family summered, uh, that there's been a massive change in when birds arrive and when, uh, when plants bloom. And, that, and as you can see, they're different, which influences pollination strategies and influences when these things can actually persist and survive. Another great record or indicator of climate is Lake Mendota, one of the longest ice records we have uh, in the US. And not surprisingly, ice duration has changed from about 120 days to about 90 days. And that has all sorts of implications for recreation, for ice fishing, for how strong algal blooms are in the summer, uh, and all sorts of interesting things. My own work has shown that actually shorter ice periods actually leads to windier summers because of the effect of ice on stability of the atmosphere. Interestingly, the hydrologic cycle is responding. And so Wisconsin has gotten wetter, but primarily in the winter, uh, and that's both rain and snow. And in the summer, you have Northern Wisconsin has kind of been drier for a lot of years. Uh, that's slowly been changing in the last few. Uh, but Southern Wisconsin, which I think a lot of us have felt, uh, has gotten wetter. And you know that's certainly influenced uh, both uh, Southwestern Wisconsin floods in particular, where we have hilly topography, as well as places like Milwaukee, where you have infrastructure overload in terms of uh, sewage outflow and things like that. And it's very consistent with the idea that a more warmer atmosphere is a more energetic atmosphere. So you have more evaporation and more precipitation. So wet areas tend to get wetter, whereas dry areas get drier. It's not entirely how it's working, but that's roughly what's happening around the world. Um, and so the frequency of three inch rainfalls in Madison, right, has basically gone off the charts over the last 50 years. And most of that is occurring in May and June, which makes a lot of sense. You have a lot of intense evaporation. You're going to have a lot more intense uh, precipitation in response. Now, hopefully I've convinced you that climate is changing and things are going uh, and that these have some impacts on society and, and, the, and the planet. The question is, where are we headed, right? And so this is another great Twitter um, uh, graphic from a paper that was just published in Science. Here we are in different scenarios. The way climate scientists project the future is we say, okay, well, what are we likely to do with population, with fossil fuels? Uh, Richard and I were just talking about this great website uh, that you can go to where you can play with a lot of those assumptions and see how that affects uh, future emissions. But broadly, you can kind of think of it in two big categories. We can either kind of keep doing what we're doing and use fossil fuels at roughly the same rates or maybe even increase it as population continues to increase and economic activity increases, neither of which I'm putting a value judgment on because they're actually, right, population is increasing because we're doing a better job of saving lives and that's good. And the econo economy is growing because we're doing a better job of reducing poverty, which is also a fundamentally important. But 
if we don't do something about emissions, we end up on one of these two trajectories, one that puts us into what the climate of the Earth was about uh, 30 million years ago in the Eocene, or one that puts us onto with some amount of warming, but something that might be manageable, right? And when people talk about, oh, we only have 12 years to fix climate change, which is a little bit of hyperbole, what they're saying is really, we have a short period of time now, the window really is now to make decisions that has long-term consequences for where climate is headed over the next century. And then if we wait another decade or two, which is often a common response because yes, we are, will be richer in the future, we'll have better technology in the future, um, but there may be cases where it's essentially too late to make effective decisions that limit the harmful effects of climate change. So it's basically the same thing as here. Here we are in emissions and temperature. And the real question is, you could almost, this almost looks just like all those figures from, the, from uh, COVID, right? You know, like when do we bend the curve? Except instead of talking about four or five months, we're talking about decades to centuries, right? And that's really the big challenge in climate change is the same type of messaging and the same type of questions have to be asked if we rapidly change our um, behavior that limits emissions versus waiting a few decades versus not changing behavior, how does that change climate? And the hard part is at least for the first 10 to 20 years, making hard decisions now doesn't really tell, you don't really feel the effects until a few decades out. And that's partly because the oceans take a long time to respond. That's partly because the emissions take a while to change. And it's just, it's a lot like the pandemic in some ways in that in April, we were asked to make a lot of decisions that sounded counterintuitive, that sounded really draconian. And by June, we weren't even sure if they were making a difference or not, right? Because there was, we were still waiting. And as we learned, unfortunately, at least in the US, when we eased restrictions, things got a lot worse, uh, but it took months to actually learn that. And the problem is that climate change has got the same problem, except it's now extended out over decades. So when it comes to Wisconsin, the story is basically the same. Uh, we have continued warming of winter faster than summer uh, of about four to five degrees Fahrenheit, so about two degrees Celsius by mid-century, regardless of what we do emissions wise. But really it's when we get to 2100 that we have, at least with our projections, a real difference in temperature, depending on if we're on a moderate growth in emissions trajectory or a intensive growth in emissions trajectory. And that has implications. So for example, the wiki report goes into talking about trout fishing. I don't fish, so I will likely say something wrong about this. Uh, but one of the things that uh, they brought up is of course, they can actually then simulate the likelihood of the niche for trout, which cold water uh, fish, for which streams in Wisconsin are fishable and stockable for trout under a current climate, under a best case scenario where you lose some of the Southwest Wisconsin streams, and under scenarios where you actually lose most but the far north. And so these are the types of decisions that individuals, for example, on the ground have to consider when they're saying, how do I actually adopt and address climate change issues? You know, is this, a is this level something that we could tolerate or not? I don't know, right? Is this something we can actually adapt or mitigate by changing something about streams? That's a question that can be asked. In my own work, I spend a lot of time thinking about Northern Wisconsin forests. We have some of the most productive forests in the country. They are large expanse across the Northern part of the state above the so-called tension zone. And one of the things we're learning from forestry, this is from the so-called climate change field guide where the forest service has been working with foresters to understand for climate change is there's a lot of uncertainty and the way things change is somewhat you know, unique, right? We're heavily dependent on winter logging. So that warming of winter has a big impact on forestry in Wisconsin. So this increase in growing seasons may allow for more productive forests, but it may make them harder to harvest. Interestingly, even if it's getting wetter, because these forests are more productive, they're gonna use more water and it may actually make soil moisture drier. And that's something that our lab is trying to figure out and trying to understand if we can actually detect that in our measurements. There's also this complicated question, ecology of invasives. So certain plants, uh, especially from the tropics, uh, tend to disproportionately benefit under a higher CO2, higher temperature environment. And you know, we call a plant invasive if it's something that can say, take over what the plants are in an existing area. I mean, this is somewhat of an anthropogenic definition, but this has implications for the types of plants you wanna manage, whether that's in forestry or agriculture or conservation land. <clears throat> 
And another thing that's really happening right now is that the deer are loving this climate um, and deer benefit from climate change. And that has a disproportional impact on which species of trees. For example, in my work, we can show maple forests are unlikely to have uh, good outcomes under a warmer climate without effective deer management. Um, this has actually changed some of my own opinions about how we should effectively harvest and hunt deer uh, in this state. We're suggesting that you know, we can actually protect forests by intensifying deer management. So let's kind of wrap up, where do we go, right? And broadly, hopefully I've shown you that to some extent, there's some level of climate change where you have to essentially deal with it. That's called adaptation. And some level that we can maybe try to limit the harmful effects by reducing emissions. Right, and, and so this nut figure shows basically where we are today. And the nice thing about climate change physics is that it doesn't matter when or who or how we emit CO2, it's just how much we do cumulatively over history of society. And how does climate change? It's linear, right? So if we emit 4,000 billion tons of CO2, climate will change roughly two degrees Celsius. Most climate experts suggest that once you get above 2C warming, and we've done one so far, um, is when the negative impacts of climate change outweigh the positive benefits of higher productivity, longer growing seasons, and so on. And if we stabilize emissions today, we're going to get somewhere near that, but it would really take capturing CO2 from the atmosphere and sequestering it to actually stay below that. And that's actually a very complicated topic politically. Um, and if we wait 30 years, we get here. And if we don't do anything, we get over here. And I think this is a nice way to conceptualize why adaptation and mitigation has to happen. Adaptation is complicated, but it involves a variety of things, including things like climate refugees. Do we move people from places that are being covered in sea level? Or can we use technology like bigger seawalls? And it has all sorts of complication questions about vulnerability and who can afford it and who gets affected. One of the big things about climate change vulnerability is it primarily affects developing world, it primarily affects minorities, it primarily affects women and children more, it affects vulnerable populations in a way differently than most people. And so it might be that even for you, climate change is not going to affect you that much, but it's going to affect the world around you. And so we're already seeing that occurring. This is the Outer Banks in North Carolina where uh, sea level rise has been continuing. And so people tend to put their houses higher up. Uh, insurance companies then price this risk as well. That influences who lives there. And part of that is that even if we stopped emitting all CO2 today, sea level still goes up by another 50 centimeters, um, which is enough for a place like a barrier island on the east coast of the US to be significantly impacted by the next tropical storm that's going to bring storm surge, the leading cause of death in hurricanes, which is flooding, uh, to be much worse than it would be otherwise. And even if we then committed to reducing emissions by under a variety of different scenarios, there's still some level of sea level rise that could be significant. When it comes to mitigation, right, we tend to think very, very, uh, we often tend to think in our narrow lenses of one thing or another, but the reality is that reducing emissions from greenhouse gases involves a variety of things, some of which are economic, like taxes and, and so forth, some of which are regulatory, like standards, some of which are societal or technological. And I know I'm short on time, so I'm going to kind of uh, skip over this slide, but the basic idea is the same. We have to make a decision that leads us to a different climate. I may ask, okay, a lot of you have certain opinions about energy, for example, right? Nuclear, renewable, something else. And my bottom line here is I'm not going to make a, a strong judgment here, except to say that one, power and energy is only one piece of the climate change mitigation puzzle. It's about 20%, right? There's also transportation, agriculture, and a variety of other things. There are pros and cons to every energy option beyond its impact on climate, right? Whether that's solar, wind, nuclear, hydro, geothermal, and tidal. And the short answer is no one of these is going to solve all of the climate change uh, issues of energy alone. We are seeing, though, a lot of exciting things. Fossil fuels are being phased out in lots of the world. Coal plants are no longer ec ec economical to operate in the U.S. Solar is now the cheapest energy to produce in most of the world. Right, and that's so not surprisingly, these headlines just in the last couple of weeks, right, Dane County for the county to go all renewable to offset virtually all of its emissions for the county, so the county government itself. Um, Wisconsin statewide, we energies are retiring almost two gigawatts of fossil fuels. That's primarily shuttering about two to three coal plants in eastern Wisconsin and replacing that with a variety of renewable sources. South Australia just managed to get all of its power from solar in the last month. 
Uh, in the UK, uh, they just proposed 16 new mini nuclear plants. I don't know a lot about what these specifically are, uh, but it seems like a way potentially around some of the challenges of building some of the larger nuclear installations that tend to have a lot of public opposition. And in the meanwhile, we have a new president elect uh, who wants to be the climate president and has already put out agency memos for every single agency. And one of the questions you might be wondering is, well, didn't we just say China's the biggest emitter? How do we deal with that? We'll get back to that in a sec. So that, those are all headlines just from the last week. You can tell I'm a news junkie. Um, I love this figure, right? This is showing the percentage of Britain's power from coal from 2012 to 2020. And green here is 0%. Look at the number of days in 2020 that Britain, right? The birthplace of coal, the birthplace of the industrial revolution is no longer using coal for energy. Um, things are changing fast. And this is really encouraging to me, right? There's a lot of money to be made as part of this. And there's a lot of understanding, at least among large scale energy industry, that they are culpable and that they have a role to play. What's also amazing is how rapidly solar has been um, expanding. So each one of these lines here is an estimate from the World Energy Organization of how much solar there would be in the world in gigawatts. And the black curve is what's actually happened. Um, solar installations have far outpaced any projection of any um, organization or industry it has ever done, right? Things are occurring at a pretty rapid place. The world is changing. Now, what about this question of China? China actually has been spending a lot on renewable energy, spending a lot on nuclear energy, spending a lot on transportation infrastructure. But the big elephant in the room is even though China produces most of the world's emissions, that's partly because they have a billion people. The US still per capita produces nearly uh, two times the emissions of China and uh, about Europe, right? And the question is, Europe's standard of living is not that different from the US, but they've had a long-term history of regulatory policies and you know, different densities and different transportation infrastructure. So it's not entirely the same. And we have been bending this curve a little bit, right? And a lot of this has been because we've been phasing out coal with natural gas, which emits less CO2, but still emits CO2. Um, but there's a real question of, you know, do we have more room to go? And the answer is maybe, right? So there's been lots of work looking at so-called wedges of climate stabilization. There isn't any one thing we can do to keep our emissions from doubling over the next century. And, but there are lots of things that individually kind of solve some of the problem, whether that's better use of electricity, better passenger vehicle standards, whether that's the adoption of renewables and other energy sources, whether that's carbon capture from power plants. And each one of these together actually reduces emissions dramatically. My favorite website lately is something called Project Drawdown, which actually goes into deep dives of, set up by Paul Hawken uh, of Smith and Hawken. And each one of these, they actually go into details of what exactly would it be reduced if we say replace the remaining refrigerants in the world of alternatives, because they, they turn out to be really strong greenhouse gases and how much would it cost and who would have to do it? And they rank these based on emissions sequestered. And the idea is to actually provide policy guidance for things that I think most of the people are support as useful things, things like improving uh, health and education, particularly for women, changes population and changes autonomy in economic decision-making. Things like tropical forest restoration improves biodiversity, but also improves the carbon sink. Um, changes in uh, distributed power systems, peatland protection, forest restoration, reducing food waste. Um, I think it's very hard to find somebody who would be against any of these things, in, at least in principle. In my own work, we're showing, for example, that um, forest management, we can still sustainably harvest forests, but we could probably, through subtle changes in how we thin and manage forests, sequester about 10% of our U.S. emissions. That's not enough, but that's a wedge, right? My postdoc, Susie Wiesner, has been working at a farm outside of uh, Prairie de Sac, where they've been uh, intensively studying dairy, measuring everything coming in and out of a cow, in and out of a tractor, in and out of manure. It's, it's not a pretty project, but it, we have really good information now on how we can change subtle practices that both reduce emissions and potentially under carbon markets could increase profit for an industry that's currently in crisis. Right. Similarly, I just had an undergraduate, this is my kids actually in a corn maze uh, in Train and Farm. Uh, but, uh, you know, we are, of course, in the uh, breadbasket of the world and agriculture is a major part of society and food security is fundamental. But we just have this paper in review right now, hot off the press, um, 
we're finding that, you know, even though crops have increased in yield from genetics and fertilizer and better management, we do have heat stress leads to yield loss, droughts, uh, warm years. But we haven't really seen a lot of that in the U.S. because they've been offset by improving air quality. And so what we're arguing in this paper is one way we can maintain food security even under a changing climate is to continue working on improving air quality even in the U.S. And that's actually a really interesting message because even though we tend to think of our air as relatively clean in the U.S. and for the most part, there is more to go. We can improve yields by another 10% or more just by continuing to decrease air pollution, which might help offset the heat extremes from droughts and floods. And I think the other thing that's encouraging is that we're seeing a large movement. Um, you know, climate change is the number one or two issue among uh, people who are 18 to 30 in terms of the issues they vote and care about. This is just a picture of Greta Thunberg, the uh, European climate activist in a recent march. Um, there's a lot of interest and discussion occurring at this. There's a generational shift. And I saw this same generational shift when I was a kid and how recycling and the ozone hole and things like that were partly changed by how young people changed behavior, right? And sometimes that's what it takes and that's maybe what we're seeing. There's wonderful climate communicators way better than I am. People like Catherine Hayhoe have this great YouTube channel she calls Global Weirding. I encourage you to check it out if you wanna get these nice sound bites that you can share with people. Um, and, and, you know, the, I'll skip over that, but you know, there are challenges, right? You know, there is this uh, book by Naomi Oreskes, Emergence of Doubt, also a PBS documentary, um, about the fact that there are, of course, entrenched interests who have at their heart an interest in causing having disinformation limit political change. And this is true whether it's the same people, right, who fought against uh, tobacco, who fought against ozone, who fought against global warming. And that you know, does that can be discouraging, but it's also useful to shed some light onto how and why um, that occurs and that there are ways around that. You know, and I said, showed this picture of a campfire toward the end to kind of think about even if climate change isn't your number one issue, the thing I like to think about is that there's lots of things around the world that we want to make the world a better place, right? And whether that's reducing terrorism, water pollution, urban, you know, addressing urbanization, oppression of minorities public health, food security, species, natural land degradation, wealth inequality, or educational access. My bottom line is that for all of these, climate change makes them harder or more expensive to solve. And so if you care about any one of these things, not also addressing climate change makes it your goal that much worse in terms of trying to you know, make this world one that my children and their grandchildren will inherit and will be able to sustainably live in uh, but I'm an optimist, I have to be in my profession, right? And here's a recent uh, State Street mural that my kids helped paint. Uh, love is greater than fear, right? And I see that among the people. I see it among people like you who care and want to sit here and listen to me for an hour, um, that there's a lot happening right now. Uh, it may sometimes seem hopeless. It may sometimes feel like the forces of darkness are preventing uh, rational discussion from occurring but I want you to feel and do not leave this talk with a sense of hopelessness, but with a sense of love and optimism that there is a lot happening and that there are a lot of good people out there today. And so with that, I thank you. Hooray, great uh, presentation. And Kurt, thank you very much. Uh, I have a few questions myself, but I'd like to uh, pass along some uh, questions from the audience. Um, Perhaps, perhaps while I'm waiting for a couple of those, I will pop one question. And that is um, uh, that you, you focus a lot on air temperature and, uh, mm -hmm. and touch briefly on water temperature in the oceans. But what, what are your thoughts about CO2 contributing to acidification of the oceans, mm -hmm. okay. particularly as it relates to shellfish, oyster production, and possibly even krill? I'm not sure how much krill will be affected, but they do have a carbonate shell and, and they might uh, not survive as well without a good shell. So would you have any right. thoughts on that? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, I focus on air temperature partly because that's our best set of measurements, right? And it's only until recently that we've had a really good network of ocean temperatures. There's now been thousands of these so-called robot submersibles that have been deployed across the ocean basins. What we can tell from that data is yes, the oceans are getting warmer. 
they're, and they're absorbing about two thirds of the heat that's being added to the atmosphere from climate change. So it's actually a big deal. And that's partly like, we tend to think of sea level rise as primarily driven by ice melt, but it's actually primarily driven by the heating of water because warm water is less dense than cold water above four degrees Celsius. But this other point you bring up is also important, which is that as you increase CO2 in the atmosphere, uh, some of that CO2 dissolves in the ocean because the ocean wants to be in equilibrium with the atmosphere, just like a bottle of soda. And as you increase CO2 in the, in the oceans, you change its pH or its acidity, so it becomes more acidic. It's a really, really small change, but that small change is enough to influence how effectively organisms that rely on building shells out of ca calcium carbonate, which has CO2 with calcium, um, can persist. And so there's been a lot of work, it's not my main area of expertise, but some of the oceanographers I work with um, have really looked at this so-called ocean acidification problem. And there's good paleo records that show that in the past when we've had high CO2s, we've had these die-offs in ocean organisms. And the real question for society is that those are, many of those organisms um, are at the base of the food chain, right? And so that affects everything up and above into fisheries and sustainable catch and things like that. Um, there's, there are lots of ongoing studies right now looking at some of these in coastal oceans, looking at whether you, know, you can apply different catch limits for things like shell building organisms, um, you know, everything from, from shrimp to scallops and, and onward. Krill, I don't have a good answer for, I would think yes. Um, and then similarly with coral, coral are also affected by uh, acidification. They're more affected by temperature, but even still um, there's been a number of so-called bleaching events where the organisms that live in, on coral as a, in a symbiotic relationship are not surviving. Good, well, thank you for that. I'm uh, um, like you, I find the, the uh, ocean acidification problem something that is, uh, um, kind of lurks in the background and concerns me a bit because I have this feeling that, that we may be able to uh, have mutations um, more effectively to deal with increased temperature than with, with lower pH. Uh, um, yeah, it, it's, it's quite know, possible. Yeah, I, th I think that could be a problem. Mm -hmm. I'm looking for some more questions here. I, I'm looking under chat and I don't see, uh, come on, we're an active group, but guys, uh, let's have some questions coming out of, of uh, I don't see any here, maybe I'm not. Um, there's uh, only hosts and panelists can see the questions, so that may be, I'd be glad to, read them and propose them, but I'm not seeing any on the list yet. And so no use worries. your Q&A function. <laughs> and, uh, oh, here's one that's coming in. Oh, you, you're seeing it too, good. Yeah. It's, I'm not seeing them any yet. Okay, uh, so I'll, I'll read this question I just saw. Please do. Uh, it says, I'm curious why, from Doug Edwards, curious why we're seeing minimum temperatures rise and not maximum, and why from 1960 and not more continuously, what's the likelihood of significant change in ocean currents? So three good questions. Um, so I'll ask the, I'll start with the first one, which is the minimum temp thing. And, and that is um, somewhat unique to the Midwest and Great Plains. Um, there's been a couple of hypotheses and, and, but not a really good answer. One is we know that winter is gonna warm fast in mid continents because if you have less snow, you have less reflective surfaces on the ground. And so that leads to something called a feedback loop where if you have darker soils, you can absorb more heat. So you know, think about a cold January day when there's snow on the ground versus not, your highs are gonna be lower on a, on a day with snow on the ground. Um, the maximum temperatures in summer has been interesting. And, and sometimes it's actually called the warming hole. Uh, there's something similar in Southeast United States as well. And one hypothesis has been that some of the warming of climate has been masked by a dramatic increase in irrigation of the Great Plains. Uh, since 1960 to support um, the massive expansion of agriculture we've seen since then, um, which makes sense to me a little bit. I, I don't have really positive, like, you know, we've been looking at that too in our lab and, and I, I'm not ready to go on a limb yet and say that that's the cause, uh, but it does seem to be that increased irrigation, which makes air more humid, makes it harder to warm up. And so it doesn't warm as fast. Um, we are seeing some 
Other aspects that changes to clouds and precipitation might also be changing surface temperature by limiting that rise, even though it's increasing aloft. From 1960 onward, some of that is that is when you see both the acceleration of fossil fuel use and population growth um, globally. Um, and so, you know, it, it took us 30 to 40 years to go from one to two billion. It took us another 30 to 40 years to go from two to four billion and another 30 to 40 years to go from four to eight billion. Uh, so there's kind of this acceleration where the growth is exponential. And so the response it, it kind of it is, is also in the same way, but it looks it's harder to tell against the noise of weather coming and going until from about 1960 onward is the way to kind of think about it. Um, and then ocean currents, uh, again, not an oceanographer. There are, we just hired a great oceanographer at UW who would encourage you to invite her uh, at some point and she could tell you all sorts of things. But um, um, ocean currents are, are an interesting one. Um, there's some evidence, ocean currents, there's two big broad types of ocean currents. There's uh, the surface ocean currents, which broadly are driven by the winds. And then there's the deep ocean currents, which are much, much slower, and they're driven by changes in temperature and density of the ocean and salinity. So the fast ones are driven by the winds. And so to the extent that winds change, and there has been some evidence that like the jet stream is maybe slowing down a little bit. There are some great papers showing that it's actually making it more expensive for transatlantic flights and things like that, um, because they have to burn more fuel. Uh, and that would change surface ocean currents in some way. Um, I don't have a good feel for whether that's been detectable or not. The deep ocean currents, there has been some more focus on because that influences things like the Gulf Stream, which brings all that warm air to Europe and is why Europe is so much warmer than Canada, despite being the same latitude. Um, the problem is that those things take hundreds and hundreds of years to really manifest themselves. And so, yes, we are seeing that that cooling of the ocean off the North Atlantic. And it's, it is a really cool thing. The North Atlantic drives this like global ocean circulation that connects all the basins and is changing or slowing that um, so-called conveyor belt of water that makes it from the Atlantic to Antarctica and out to the Pacific. Um, but whether that will affect climate is a to be seen type of question. It will certainly have some effect thousand years from now, right? But it's not one that we have a good feel for like today. I, you know, it was the premise, for example, of that, that terrible climate change movie, The Day After Tomorrow, right? Where New York froze in ice and all that stuff was that the ocean slowed down and that's what caused it. Um, that got, they got most of the physics wrong, but the, the basic premise of that was kind of correct. <laughs> but um, yeah. What's the name of your new oceanographer faculty? Uh, Elizabeth Maroon. We just hired her this year. Uh, she comes to us from, uh, from um, MIT and then she was at Boulder, Colorado. And um, I think MIT. And um, yeah, she works on modeling global ocean circulation. So um, very sharp. She gives good public talks. Um, she's new, so don't. Know, how do you spell her last name? M-A-R-O-O-N, -O -O like the color. Yep. Just like the color, okay. Yeah. And she's on the web. I can look her email up and stuff. Yep, yep, yep. Good. She has a website it's on our department uh, website. So good, excellent. I will look forward to inviting her for next spring. I think that that sounds like a great talk. Yeah. Any others you may suggest? Uh, we'd be sure. uh, glad to. Uh, you, yeah, I mean, we've been recently the UW. Even though we're you know facing the same financial challenges as everyone else, um, we have in the last few years been able to make some strategic hires in climate. Uh, right. science, which has been great. And so we just hired a few in our department, but also the La Falla School of Public Affairs just hired a climate policy expert. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's been some nice, uh, some, some nice synergies going on. And I'm sure, you know, I'm, I'm always hesitant to make assistant professors go out and give lots of talks, but there's a lot of people who are doing some really bang up research right now who I'm sure would eventually love to speak with I your think group. The great yeah. synergy, wonderful. Yeah. Um, city we live in Madison to have uh, university faculty available and it works both ways that's good yeah. synergy thank you so okay another, let's get back to your other questions sure so this question from Lee says a uh, question about whether three degrees makes a difference could you discuss what happens to that small temperature change right so the way to think about this is the difference between the last ice age and and our current so when Wisconsin was covered with a mile thick of ice um, is about uh, about five degrees Celsius difference in average temperature, right? That's enough to make Wisconsin basically completely frozen. And the difference between us and the land when dinosaurs roamed Wisconsin, even though the continents are in a different spot, is also roughly about five to six degrees Celsius change, right? So 
it's kind of like your thermostat, right? Like we tend not to think a lot about a one or two de degree difference outside, but you know, if you turn your thermostat up from like 68 to 70 or 71, it definitely gets a good bit warmer in your house. And it's the same idea here where a small change like one or two or three is enough to essentially push all those extremes of climate weather more toward one side than the other. Now, this question of like, well, how much is too much, right? So we've had about one degree Celsius of warming to date, and that's led to um, increasing the intensity of storms and increasing some of these things we've seen today. Um, if we go another degree, um, there may be some increasing vulnerability to crops, particularly in the developing world and tropics. Uh, we might see some you know, major ecosystems and forest under higher stress and higher water use and drought. Uh, but there may be some other good things, right? So, you know, folks in Canada and Russia may have, if they have suitable soil, places that could actually be uh, more suitable for farming than otherwise. In fact, Canada is super excited about taking over maple syrup from Vermont. Um, and, you know, there's actually a gold rush right now in Hudson Bay, uh, where uh, multiple multinational companies are setting up in Manitoba uh, on the idea of having an ice-free Arctic, which is possible uh, with a two degree Celsius warming and being able to have a Northern shipping route uh, is an economic boom. It's the same reason the Russians planted a flag in the Arctic as well and underneath the ocean. There's all sorts of geopolitical things that are happening. That, you know, I often view those as signs, right? If an oil company is investing a billion dollars to build a new port in Manitoba, um, that's got to mean something, right? They have to have seen the same data I have. Now, when you get above two, that's when you really start to see those issues with um, food security being, I think, the number one issue and sea level being the second issue. So you really start to see that in, in our own, my own, that own paper on air pollution, right? We've been really good agricultural wise, even with all the negative side effects of intensification and mechanization um, of really being able to increase yields and feed the world. It's actually remarkable since the so-called green revolution in the 1950s, how well we've been able to feed the world and essentially limit or minimize the effects of hunger on, on childhood mortality and things like that, right? You know, there's, but, um, there are limits to that, and there's good evidence that we can see in how yields are responding today that, you know, we can only go so far in genetic hybridization, we can only go so far in fertilizers and pesticides and irrigation uh, before we can continue to keep yields in pace with the rate of climate change and CO2 change that we would expect. And that I think is one of the big number one concerns, and because that, that has all sorts of downstream effects, because if you have crop failure, that has geopolitical implications for individual populations that are going to seek refugee status. You have implications for global trade and shipping. You have implications for uh, economic development. Uh, and the same thing with sea level. So low small island nations are the ones that are on top of this, but even coastal areas, I think the US is actually uniquely vulnerable in terms of its eastern coast, uh, even though we have the money, say, to spend it. Uh, what's been interesting to me is the amount of money that the insurance companies have been spending lately. So reinsurance in particular, which are the companies that insure the insurance companies, um, have been spending billions lately on climate research. They've been hiring people from our department uh, to be able to do scenario development because they see this coming in their portfolio in future. Even American Family has been investing, uh, our local insurer, um, large amounts of research dollars into this question uh, because even things like changing hail damage uh, in Madison itself is affecting their bottom line. Um, so another question came in, uh, what is the time constant involved with changes to climate? How long does it take to see the full impact of CO2 and what we observe? Seems like we should looking for changes with small time, but signals to predict uh, what will happen along. Who asked that question? Uh, Doug Edwards. Oh yeah, yeah. good. Yeah. yeah, so this is a this is a good question, right? So the, what, um, what the uh, question is getting at is the fact that when you emit a greenhouse gas, right, there is an instantaneous response. The atmosphere changes its infrared budget and that changes temperature, but it takes a while for like everything else to adjust. So some of that infrared is going to heat up the ground. The ground takes a while to heat up. The oceans take a while to heat up and give that heat back to the atmosphere. Uh, the carbon cycle takes a while to respond. So photosynthesis might take a few generations to change, things like that. And so in climate science, we broadly talk about two types of climate change. One is called transient climate sensitivity and one's called equilibrium climate sensitivity. And it's a mouthful, but basically it's exactly what you describe it, right? Transient is that short-term immediate change, which sometimes can be larger or even smaller 
uh, than the equilibrium change. And that transient change is occurring over the time scale of a decade, right? The same way I did that back at the envelope calculation in the beginning of the talk. And that's telling you roughly, okay, if we emit something, this is what's gonna change. And that's where a lot of the policy focus is on, right? Because things like methane, for example, which have a shorter lifetime in the atmosphere, we can do in a back, we can do an analysis of saying, if we limit methane emissions today, we know in 20, 30 years how climate might respond. On the flip side, there's equilibrium climate sensitivity. And this goes into things like even the ocean acidification question. Um, because CO2 has an average lifetime of a century in the atmosphere, so a molecule you emit today will stay in the atmosphere for about a century on average, right? So technically, mathematically, it's an e-folding time. Um, and then there's lots of additional things that happen down the road, right? So for example, it takes a while for glaciers to recede. And the glaciers receding changes the reflectivity of Earth's surface, which then changes how much heat it, heat it can absorb. So that kind of thing occurs on a much longer time scale, um, or you know, an increase in the change of forests. And we know some of that, right? So all of the studies in the past from geology are basically trying to estimate equilibrium climate sensitivity, um, because that's the only thing we can really see in the record. Um, so there is some complications, right, of trying to connect the two, right? From a policy perspective, you might be more interested in one. From a long-term, like, climate science is my math right, you might be interested in the other. It's fun. So the climate models actually are run out three to 400 years, uh, even though we only look at that first 100 years, because people don't necessarily want that for, you know, nobody really cares about what the climate is going to look like in 400 years from the perspective of policy, but we want to make sure that we're getting the right equilibrium sensitivity in this model. Because the way these computer models are run is that you're predicting using basically Newton's laws of motions and thermodynamics and all, and the same models as weather models, the state of the climate, temperature, pressure, humidity, radiation for every grid box on the globe, up through the atmosphere and into the ocean and across the land, every 20 minutes out into the future under a range of different projections of future emissions. And it is computationally expensive. It takes about six months of a 5,000 processor supercomputer that burns $100,000 worth a month of electricity uh, to run one climate simulation. And that's why these things uh, take a lot, a lot of effort and time and thousands of people kind of working on the physics. And it's really these, all these interactions, right? The physics is straightforward, but it's really, okay, what happens to the ice? What happens to the land? What happens to the ocean? And how does that feed back onto the climate that really you need the climate model for? And also, which warms faster, the continents or the oceans, high latitudes, low latitudes, Eastern United States, Western United States. Those are the only things you need those kind of computer models to do. It's fun. I try to stay away from it. And for some reason, we still use a programming language called Fortran from the 1970s. Um. <laughs> some more questions? I've got a couple, but I'll hold back unless you've got some more there. Uh, nope. Uh, how do you evaluate model uncertainty? Again, from Doug Edwards. Uh, great. Oops, I lost my headphone here. Um, good question. So generally what happens is, and, and this is a, there's two things that happen. What started on early on was something called a climate model intercomparison project. So around the 1980s, during when Jim Hansen and others at NASA were developing their climate model, um, groups around the world who were all building similar types of models with slightly different levels of complexity, because uh, you have to make some trade-offs about how precise you model one versus the other for computational speed. Um, put together an experiment where about 20 or so of those groups all ran models under the same exact initial conditions and boundary conditions, so the fossil fuel emissions, where economists and demographers said, okay, this is how many people there are and how much they're going to emit under different ranges of scenarios. You run your models and tell us what happens. And that actually feeds into that so-called um, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report that occurs every four to five years that's um, under the auspices of the World Meteorological Organization and the UN, which then feeds into the discussions on the Paris Agreement and other treaties. Um, so that group gets together and all the model data is public and open access and people run each of these models and compare them. So a lot of the times when you see that uncertainty that future climate will be three plus or minus one C, part of that is the uncertainty in each of those models. And now computers have gotten faster. Um, the other thing that some models can do is they can run what we call ensembles. And this is actually how we do weather forecasting as well. We take the same model, but we slightly perturb the initial state because we don't perfectly measure everything. Uh, 
And we slightly perturb some of the physics. So we say, well, we don't exactly know how a cloud is formed because that's a really small scale process and we can only model the large scale process. And, and then you could run hundreds of these. And then you can see to what extent they're all gonna kind of end up in the same place, but they'll get there from slightly different ways uh, because of the so-called deterministic chaos of weather. Um, and so your personality is changing, but whether you're happy or sad on Tuesday or Wednesday might be different. Might be different in one case versus the other, depending on how your life was on Sunday. So that's what they do now as well, and that also gives us another way to get uncertainty. But it is a big question, right? Because we want to make sure our uncertainty is less than the project the different projections of fossil fuel emissions. Otherwise, we don't give them useful information, right? Otherwise, you know we can say, okay, well, you cut your emissions in half, but we don't actually know if climate's gonna change. That's not a useful story to tell. So sorry, that was detailed into the, into the, into the weeds a bit, but it is kind of a, a fun topic in and of itself. It is. I'd, I'd like to ask you a question pertaining to your title. I thought it was a very provocative title. You said climate changes can people. Mm -hmm. Given that you're a news junkie and an optimist, <laughs> I'm gonna hold you a little bit to your mm -hmm. title and ask you if you give us a projection, do you think we will, uh, do we will change and if we'll change in time? How, how severe do you think we're gonna get? Yeah, change in time is a good question. I, I do think, you know, and again, I go back because I've been thinking a lot about the pandemic and COVID and, you know, there's gonna be some similar things where there's gonna be places that do get bad. There's gonna be resistance to some policies. There's going to be, um, you know, periods where it seems like it's, you know, like maybe right now, where it seems really um, uh, almost hopeless. But at the same time, you know, there's a lot of people out there, right? And we also had really good news on vaccines today, right? We also had, you know, wonderful people who have been really working hard to come up with good ways. And, you know, I, I'm really encouraged whenever I give talks to to younger audiences. No offense, I, this is a great group. But you know, it's I, when you when you go to talk to like a college student group or even a high school group, like I did last year, um, they they know this stuff well. This stuff is now taught in schools as fundamental science, right? And for at least in Madison, it is, and hopefully in most places. And it's it's you know, the stu the kids talk about climate change far more than even my generation does. Um, and that gives me hope that that's, you know, that's the only way things change, right? Is when people talk about it, then politicians respond to it, right? And so, and we're seeing that. And, you know, I'm, you know, I'm hopeful that, you know, even under our current uh, administration, many agencies were doing a lot of work on trying to mitigate climate change. They may have had to change, you know, how they messaged it. And maybe their leadership at the, set, at the cabinet level may have not been, uh, had the same perspective or perceptions, but, you know, the, the US government is full of really brilliant climate scientists and policymakers and economists and all the folks who need to think about this, who still do the same work they do every day. Um, and I think it may take some acceleration. And I think it's exciting to see what's happening in Europe. You know, the, well, I'll, actually starting at tonight at 2 a.m., I have to join a European advisory board um, where, you know, they have been pushing the boundaries of how do we measure fossil fuel emission reductions, right? And I'm on a board that advises them on that. And, um, you know, it's really cool to see some things happening and hopefully we'll see the same again in the federal government, but certainly at the state and county and industry level, there's been a lot going on that makes me optimistic. And I think if I was too pessimistic, I'd have a hard time doing my job. And so I do have to like protect my emotional core at some level too, so. There's a, uh, I'd like to just throw in a little comment. Yeah. Have you, or a question, personal question. Have you heard of the book, Ministry of the Future? No, I'm not familiar with that one. I'm, I'm forgetting the name of the author, okay. but it's, it's written, it's, mm -hmm. it's a science fiction yeah. um, which looks ahead to 2050. Mm -hmm. And India features very strongly in that story because mm. India suffers very badly from uh, a heat wave that kills, uh, mm -hmm. I think, several thousand people in, mm -hmm. in the continent. And so the, India takes upon itself in this fiction to uh, uh, send up some mm. rockets with uh, sulfur, I think sulfur, uh, or sulfate particles to deflect uh, the sun's rays. Hmm. This has been proposed and I think poo-pooed very much mm 
but I'm not sure how many people are taking this seriously anymore because, of course, that would exacerbate <laughs> uh, acid warming. Acid, yeah. Acid so, so broadly, yeah, this this whole field is called geoengineering. Right? Yes. This idea of can we modify climate by essentially changing solar radiation, right? Yeah. Or by doing something dramatic to the carbon cycle, right? So for example, similar projects are like adding lots of iron to the ocean to increase its CO2 uptake, which of course has a side effect in acidification, but beyond that could, right, uh, decarbonize or reduce CO2. I'm generally not, my take on, right, intellectual discourse at least, is that we have to consider all ideas, no matter how wacky they are, because that's what we do as academics, but also that's how we get to reasonable solutions, right? Because if we don't think about the really wacky ones, like, wow, it's gonna take blowing 30 nuclear bombs every month in the stratosphere um, to cut solar radiation by 2%, um, then in some ways, in some ways, thinking about that makes some of these other things that previously sounded drastic, like, you know, uh, you know, cutting our coal usage in half sound maybe more acceptable, right? And maybe like, okay, well, I don't want to do that, and I, and, but I really don't want to do this other thing. And on the flip side, there are, maybe are some geoengineering solutions that are reasonable. So this idea of carbon capture from air right now is very, very inefficient, except at a power plant, right? So you can capture CO2 at a power plant and you could bury it underground. Um, and there are some places in the world that do that, but uh, the real challenge is where do you bury it and how much, how, how quickly does it leak out? And, but there are some neat pie in the sky technologies where people are like, yeah, we are, we have ways to remove CO2 from the air that might work. And that might have, you know, a niche solution as part of the problem. Um, like I mentioned in my crop study, you know, reducing air pollution actually can help, you know, food security, right? So there are these kind of interesting things where there are side effects that can be beneficial. I think the idea of like changing all of earth at once deliberately uh, has to become with strong caution, right? And it definitely impinges on this uh, into bioethics, right? And into ethics in general about what is the responsibility of humans to stewarding the planet and what are the ethical principles under which we operate and make decisions. That is, you know, a whole, a uh, whole nother set of can of worms. You should probably bring a philosopher in to talk about that. Um, I do see a few more questions. One in the Q and A. Um, the one that says, "What are the main sources of man-made CO two? You mentioned power is about a twenty percent. What are the others? Um, yeah. So broadly, you can kind of think of them as roughly equal categories of. Um, when I say power, I mean electricity generation. Then another. 20 to quarter is transportation. So that's basically gasoline powered vehicles. Um, another, um, uh, another fifth or so is agriculture. So all of the processes that go into the production of food through its entire cycle from planting to harvest, to shipping, to, um, to serving and wasting. Um, and then another quarter that's a kind of, or 20% that's industry. So that's all industrial processes where you use fossil fuels in some ways to make something, whether that's plastic or anything else. Um, and then the remainder is essentially residential and commercial heating uh, and other usages like that. So that's, that's roughly how uh, CO2 is uh, kind of the breakdown of emissions categories. And it's one of these things that it's, can be frustrating because it, it's very easy to want to be like, okay, well, if we all just had electric cars and trains, it'd be great. And I was like, well, you just solved the, you, you, made, you solved one piece of the problem, not the other, the rest. Or if we all had nuclear power, or all we had solar power, we'd solve the problem, but it doesn't solve. If we all just became vegetarian, we'd solve the problem. But that's, it, it, it's, it's easy to want to harp on those because we like magic bullets. We like, you know, simple things, right? But um, the problem with climate change is because it's it's a, it's a multifaceted problem with a multifaceted set of causes, all caused by fossil fuels, but used in different ways, um, and with different impacts in terms of what is the right level of reduction to minimize harm, right? And that's going to be a different answer if you're trying to prevent flooding on New York City versus trying to prevent flooding in Bangladesh, right? One of these two places can afford a lot more technology than the other to prevent the worst effects. Yeah. Very good. I think there was a quote, or no, there's a question. There's a quote from George Bernard Shaw, which is lovely. The reasonable man adapts himself to the world. The unreasonable one persists in trying to adapt the world to himself. Therefore, all progress depends on the unreasonable man. And 
that is a <laughs> classic, lovely quote. And Shaw is wonderful for those. Um, and then uh, as far as climate change mitigation is concerned, do you think it's necessary to have everyone living in apartments, walking, biking, taking mass transit, or it's reasonable to have as our sustainable model more emphasis on single family homes with EV charging? It's a bit cold in Wisconsin, of course, if I can walk most of the year, pandemic has turned people off mass transit. Yeah, um, you know, again, uh, transportation is not uh, a core area that I think in day in day out. Um, you know, I personally made choices to live close to campus, partly because it makes my life easier in terms of, you know, shuffling a life of three kids and stuff, but it also allows me to bike to work year round and things like that. But with a trade off of having to spend more to live in this relatively expensive neighborhood. Um, I, I don't know uh, what futures would look like, whether that's more urbanization or more suburbanization. We're also seeing, of course, the pandemic has helped accelerate a large scale shift to telework, right? And so does it even matter, right? If um, it's amazing how little I've driven in the last eight months, you know, and, um, and, and I don't think I would have ever expected that in my lifetime, right? And so like, it's, it's just so hard to imagine some of those futures. And that's really where you have to bring in the social scientists and, and the folks who really think about humans and planners and transportation um, to say like, this makes more sense or this is how most of the people live or, and I think the question is gonna be different, right? Depending where you are. I am certainly a proponent, right? Of making multimodal transportation possible everywhere. And there are regulations, right? That require that so that when you build a new road, when you build a new development, that there are options to walk and bike, that there are bus routes that are routed in a way that support uh, mass transit usage. Um, whether or not you know that gets adopted everywhere, I mean, that's a question of both local and national politics, but that's yeah, an interesting point. Okay, well, you raise a, a lot of mm -hmm. good points and in your, in your answers, and we're gonna be dealing with a couple of them. We've got two more weeks. Uh, of Plato, mm -hmm. and uh, after today, I will be talking about nuclear energy next week, and I'll, I'll I'm not going to deal that much with cost, but I'm going mm -hmm. to deal a lot with um, where where it's going in the future and and how to compare it with uh, and how we can work with uh, renewable energy, um, and then um, our last uh, session. We were going to talk about hydrogen hmm. and its use in transportation, but that um, lecture got canceled. And so what I've done is opened it up to another group discussion. So we'll ask Christine to help us uh, get into a discussion like we did last time. I'm going to give a, just a few slides and a short talk about electricity in aviation, um, uh, mostly with small aircraft uh, in pocket airports to reduce congestion around cities. Um, but I would welcome and would strongly urge uh, others in the group listening today to, to come prepared to talk a little bit about um, other aspects of transportation, um, cars, railway, uh, marine. I think we could do a huge amount to improve marine transportation in the uh, costs that were, um, not costs, but the pollution from um, diesel powered ships on the high seas and so on. So um, there, there are a lot of other avenues and I encourage uh, you to think about them and we'll, we'll discuss them next week. Yeah. I hope you can join us as a listener uh, for either or both of these, uh, Anchor. I'm really um, um, delighted that you have not only done the research that you're doing, but that you uh, are a news junkie and an optimist <laughs> and you're thinking about bringing these things mm -hmm. to a practical solutions and I think that made your talk today uh, more cool. um, more interesting to us and it might have been if it were just on the pure um, uh, climatology uh, but we I sure enjoyed it a lot and I'm sure Good. I, will be Good. So I, I appreciate much. it and happy for anyone to follow up ever on uh, email uh, you can find me on the website for the Department of Atmospheric Science um, and if you ever want copies of any of the figures or slides, just send me a note. I'll have, happily share those with you. I have a bunch of those on my website anyway for, for public consumption. Uh, and, and yeah, I'll, I'll see. Uh, we got uh, a few things coming up in the next couple of weeks, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll see if I'm available. Good. <laughs> yeah. It's a Monday, Mondays at 10 o'clock. Okay. And um, 
We'll, um, this is being recorded and will be available at the platomedicine.org website as well. So it might take a week or two for it to, to come up, but we'll uh, look for that. Thanks all again, right. everybody, uh, our speaker and all of our attendees. You guys uh, keep warm, have a safe week, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you next Monday. Bye-bye. All right, very good. Bye-bye now.